y'all it's me back again with another quick video i wanted to just drop in and talk quickly about something that i always get questions about which is money i always get asked on youtube and in the real world how do you pay for phd why are they paying you to go to school how did you find this money so i'm going to cover all of that briefly i'm going to try to keep this super short um, and this will only be part one. So I'll do another video installment to talk about what stipend money actually looks like and how to budget it, how to negotiate it, all that type of stuff. But this is just like a quick and dirty of how you fund PhD. So there's, I would say three primary ways that you can fund your PhD education. Um, but the most important takeaway, if you don't watch anything else, is that you, in my opinion, should not be paying for your PhD. If you're paying for your PhD, I think you might be at the wrong school. So number one way that you can be funded is on what's called a research assistantship, so a RA ship. So research assistantship is basically kind of like what you think of when you think of RAs working in a lab. You are funded for 20 hours a week to do research work. Now what this looks like is different depending on your lab and depending on the field you're in. So for many psychology or clinical psychology labs that includes some measure of clinical work. So in my lab, for example, we do full assessments. We, we run a full intervention study as well. And so PhD students that cycle through my lab will spend some percentage of their time doing clinical work for those studies and some percentage of their time doing research. Um, some people are in labs where you might not have a clinical component. And so you in those labs are expected to basically do 20 hours of research. Um, now say you're in a lab that's not in psychology, for example, um, although some of them do exist that don't have clinical work as well. You might be in a lab like mixing chemicals for 20 hours. You might be, I don't know, putting some babies in test tubes for 20 hours. Whatever your lab's research is about and whatever capacity your mentor has you being useful in, that is what your 20 hours will look like. So. When you're on research assistantship, you your research time, again, depends on your lab, but most of the time it includes like um, writing manuscripts. Um, you might participate in like lab meeting, doing journal clubs, presenting um, research ideas or proposals, writing grants, um, applying, applying for different like funding mechanisms, whatever you can do basically to further your research career and just learn how to become a really good scientist. So that is like, the quick and dirty of research assistantship. Okay, the other way with, that people typically think of being funded for PhD is a teaching assistantship um, or a TA ship. And so with teaching assistantship, I mean, it's like intuitive in the name, like you are responsible for being a TA. So if you've been an undergrad, particularly with large class sizes, you know that oftentimes professors will have TAs that are responsible for um, grading things, running lab sessions sometimes, um, maybe like proctoring tests. Uh, answering homework, like all those types of things, and sometimes even running lecture. That is what TAs do. Um, and so I, as a RA, on RA ship, I don't have to teach. It's not required. It's not included in my funded percentage time. Because I have my master's, if I wanted to teach right now, I could be an adjunct somewhere and get paid to do that. But it's not included in my stipend to be a teacher, so there are no teaching responsibilities. The main difference is, from my understanding, Teaching assistants are on their TA ship for 20 hours a week as well, so they're expected to participate in those activities for 20 hours, but in PhD, you still have to do research. And so on top of the teaching assistant responsibilities, they're also having to do things in the lab. From my perspective, which I can ask a TA, and if you're a TA, chime in here, but from my understanding, that is like an extra thing that you have to do. Like your research is not built into your TA time. So you're doing your 20 hours a week, per se, teaching, and then you also have research on top of that rather than it being sort of one cohesive thing. Um, the other big thing from my understanding or the big difference between TAs and RAs is how the funding works. So for TAs, I feel, I can't say this with a thousand percent confidence, but I feel that the funding is more strict because usually it's like your university and your department has a set amount like a base stipend that they pay t 
TAs. Um, and so, and that is like something that usually has to be negotiated within the larger college or university. Um, that's a little different than RA ship where your mentor, if the, assuming your mentor has funding, they can sort of wiggle their funds around however they need to, to fund you. Um, now, so my base stipend as an RA is the same as the base stipend as all the TAs in my cohort. Um, however, when I was applying to school, it was important for me to know where my funding was coming from because number one, it lets me know how I'm going to be spending my time. Am I going to be spending my time teaching all week or am I going to be spending my time doing clinical work? I just need to know how my time is going to look. Um, that's not to say that I didn't want to teach. I do want to teach, but I, I didn't want to have to teach and do research on top of that for time because it just looks different. The other reason is for money. Um, and so I can't say this again with a thousand percent confidence. However, my friends that are in my cohort or in teaching assistantship, most of them that I talked to didn't negotiate stipend at any of the schools that they were being recruited at. Um, because research funding is a little different and like in theory, lab, lab funding is different. Your mentor could supplement your base stipend um, if they have the money to. Not everybody has the money to do that, but if they have the money to do that, that means that you might be able to negotiate a little bit higher of a stipend. It also means that they can sort of move money around for different things. It's just, it seems to me like it's a little more freedom. Um, but I will say one of the things that you should look for when you also go on interviews is how much funding they have um, and how long they have it for. So it's not to say, you know, if you're, if some people are like, I'm on board with being a TA and that's great. However, get it how you live, um, as long as it's paid for. I'm in favor um, but if you are somebody that wants specifically to be on an RA ship it matters like how long they have money for that's not to say when they run out that they won't be able to fund you but they might have to switch you to a TA ship um, I know in my lab for example that I I don't have any doubt that I'll be funded throughout my tenure in PhD for research um, and so I'm not really concerned about ever having to teach or having you know my last year to find external funding like I'm, I'm funded and I don't have to worry about money it's not a consideration um, the third way which leads me to external funding so fellowships external funding however you want to refer to it um, basically means you find your own funding um, and this could be a number of, from a number of different outside sources um, but what I typically think of is like a fellowship and so fellowships are like kind of like a scholarship almost it's like a competitive thing that you apply for and someone pays for you essentially they pay you know they're paying either your stipend or a portion of your tuition there's all different kinds of setups um some programs do not have internal funding that might be because they're a smaller less funded institute and they just don't have as much money or whatever or the mentor that you want to work with is still like early career and doesn't have as much funding um, but you really believe in them and, and their research and you want to go there um, you can find external funding um, so like some big ones that you may have heard of fellowships are like um, the NIH F31 and RSA or like um, the NSF fellowship, which is super competitive. Um, they're all looking for different things. There's also clinical fellowships. There's all different kinds of criteria to apply to these things, but essentially you have external funding, which gives you a little bit more flexibility also with your time because you're being funded by an external source, but you still will be expected to participate in research in your lab. If you already have funding, this in your head like when I was applying to school I was like well I already have fun and I don't need to apply to fellowships because it doesn't matter that's not true you should still apply to fellowships because it is a prestigious thing to do if you get one like it looks good on your resume um, if those fellowships are in line with what you really want to be doing then you probably will get some additional mentorship some guidance some resources you might have like extra availability to get like dissertation funds all kinds of benefits that come with it um, and more than anything once you get money if you are someone that wants to do research or apply for grants or whatever, once you sort of get like that first person to say, we gave her some money, then it looks good for other future applications um, because other people also will be more likely to give you money. Um, so you wanna apply for fellowships, even if you have funding, you still wanna do it. And it's good practice for other things like grant writing or you know whatever research proposals you might put together, it's good practice. So I didn't know that, 
until I was going through interviews and I had a very nice faculty um, who helped me out and taught me all about fellowships. So you should apply for fellowships. The main thing though is if you want to go to a school, like there was a program I, I really liked. Um, I thought I really liked, I didn't know that much about it, but I thought I liked the school. Um, they didn't offer funding. So I was like, okay, well I could apply for external. I just feel like that is always an option. However, if you don't have funding secure, don't go somewhere on a hope and a prayer. Like you're going to be working like a real employee. So don't go somewhere where you're not going to get paid at all. <laughs> like you're already not going to get paid a lot. Don't go somewhere where you are not getting paid at all. It just doesn't make sense to do. Um, for a PhD. Now, if you're somebody that wants to do this ID, that's a, that's a different story. And you probably should talk to somebody who did this ID because my views on, on paying for a doctoral degree are just different. I just, I already got a lot of debt. I wasn't going to do it. So, um, three main mechanisms, RATA ship and external funding. So that's how you pay for it. Um, to answer people's questions that I get a lot. No, we do not get paid a lot. Base stipends, which I'll talk about in another video. I mean, they they range, but you're looking probably at like fifteen to thirty thousand dollars, thirty on the high end. Um, some schools, like I know Ivy League school in this city, that pays like thirty five thousand, but that is not the norm in my field. Um, so it's not a lot of money, and most people are really on the end of like lower twenties. So yeah, you want to go somewhere where you're gonna get some money, and somewhere ideally in a position or mechanism where you can finagle a little bit more money not that you're trying to shake people down for a bunch of money but just understanding that your time and your you're valuable and you have resources to offer that should be funded so i hope this helps um i get this question all the time you're not going to be rich and i'll talk more about that in another video um stay tuned i got more coming thanks for watching